Thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Jonathan Reinink. Uh, I live in Canada. I've been writing PHP for about 18 years, give or take. Uh, much of that time I've spent at a marketing agency. Outside of my work, I also try to stay as involved as I can in open source. I do most of my work with the PHP League, uh, and that's basically a group that's, uh, basically our goal is to uh, release high quality framework agnostic PHP packages. So we have about 30 projects, give or take right now, uh, two of which I've written. And I'll mention one of them throughout this talk a little bit and it's called Glide, it's like an image manipulation uh, library for PHP. But that's not what we're talking about. We're gonna talk about documentation. So I really like documentation. I'm kind of nerdy about it, uh, which is not something you probably hear every day. Um, it's sort of my, uh, that's kind of one of my bigger involvements with the PHP League. I take care of a lot, a lot of our documentation sites. Uh, and there's a few reasons why I like it. I, uh, as mentioned, I worked for 10 years at a marketing agency and I grew a strong appreciation for design and branding and just marketing in general. And I look at documentation in, in a lot of ways like the face of a project. Uh, be it a technical project or a technical service or whatever. So doing a good job in this area can make a big difference. I also like enjoying the teaching aspect of documentation. So obviously I enjoy teaching, I'm here today. Um, I like trying to anticipate the struggles that a user is gonna have when working with a piece of technology and trying to find clear explanations to help them. Uh, technical writing is really challenging and I have like no background on that, but it's I find it just enjoyable to do. Uh, because even though it is challenging, it's quite rewarding as well. Basically, seeing someone understand something that they didn't bef understand before is uh, very satisfying. And then I also obviously just like consuming documentation myself, which is really nerdy again. But if I get excited about a new piece of technology, be it a library or a framework or a service or whatever, I will literally sit down on my couch and read documentation to get a better sense of how this thing works. And uh, that's obviously granted that, you know, that documentation uh, deserves my reading. So I believe that documentation can literally make or break a project. Um, I think it's uh, a lot of the reasons, uh, th when I first got involved with the PHP League, I think that's how I got involved. The project that I submitted, I had gone over and above on the documentation to make sure it was really clear and really understandable and, and well done. And I think that's why I got the attention of the people who were involved in that project and that organization. Um, and I've heard that from other uh, people as well, other pack library maintainers. They say, you know, having good documentation basically was the thing that, you know, got the project noticed in the first place. And it sort of makes sense. Um, developers will give something the time of day if it's clear that you've given it the time of day. So your documentation shows a level of care. All right, so before I go any farther, I'd like to uh, bu uh, uh, bust uh, some myths on documentation. Uh, and they're in no particular order. So documentation, myth number one, read the, do read the code is an acceptable answer to where are the docs. Source code is not documentation. Can you learn to speak a new language by reading a dictionary? Of course not, nobody would expect that. So I'm not saying that reading, document or reading the source code isn't valuable, it is a very valuable thing, and I think ex you know, experienced developers do this all the time, but it's something that happens later on in the, in the stage. You need an in-between step first that basically explains higher level, co higher level concepts of your library or service, the concepts and the, the basic ideas that you won't necessarily get immediately from reading source code. So that's really the job of your documentation. Myth number two, auto-generated API docs are good enough. I, this is just wrong. They are not good enough. Docs that are auto-generated um, always fall short. Document Documentation really requires a human touch. So, and even a API specific documentation, I have issues with, it's not good enough either, because while API documentation is nice to have as a reference, it's not documentation, um, it's much too micro. You want something a little more macro 
to help users when they first get going on it. So it, it, it serves a p uh, purpose, but not as your primary documentation. They need to the, uh, the users need to understand how all the you know the larger pieces fit together. So here's a quote about auto-generated docs from the Django uh, from a core Django contributor. Auto-generated documentation is almost worth it worthless. At best, it's a slightly improved version of simply browsing the source. There's no substitute for documentation written, organized, and edited by hand. So he goes on to say that he actually thinks that auto-generated docs can even be worse than not having any documentation at all because it actually makes the library maintainer think that they have documentation when in reality they don't. So if you don't have documentation, just admit it. Documentation myth number three, all you need is a readme. So GitHub has really like popularized the readme file, right? Because it's a default file that's shown when you load up a project on GitHub. Um, and that's great to have a readme file. It's good, it's a good starting place, but, and I'd recommend having one, you know, list kind of a high level, really quick overview of the project and maybe a simple example, but then from there, send people to your real documentation. And the fourth myth, documentation should be easy. Okay, nobody I don't think has ever actually said that, but I do think that this is kind of like how people think about documentation sometimes. They don't see it as the hard part. They, they think of their code as the hard part. That's the tricky part, right? But uh, I'm gonna say, and I'm sorry to say, that documentation isn't easy. It takes effort, it takes practice, but I believe it's worth it. So if you were at my talk yesterday, you would have seen this quote already. That's a quote from the maintainer of the official Rust documentation. Tests are hard, so we practice to get better. Docs are hard, so we don't write any and we complain. So I think that's really, I think that really nails it. Basically, if you want to write better documentation, you need to practice it. It's not something that's just gonna come easy. It's like any skill, you gotta exercise it. So this skill can be learned incrementally. He goes on to say this. The difference between excellent docs and adequate docs is massive and takes a lot of work. But going from docs, from but going from bad docs to adequate docs is totally achievable. And I think adequate docs, I mean that in like a positive good way. Like Adequate docs are very achievable. All right, so why do we need documentation? But I want to spend a few minutes just talking about really what's the purpose of them. So there's a guy by the name of Steve Loesch who's written a lot about documentation. So I'm going to use a few quotes of from him as well because I think they really illustrate kind of the reason. He says, the purpose of documentation is to take someone who has never seen your project, teach them to be an expert user of it, and support them once they become an expert. So there's a really important word in that quote. That word is teach. Documentation is not telling people about your library or your tool or your service. It's about teaching people. It's about bringing them from the beginning and making them an expert. So I'm going to leave this with you. This will be in the slides. I'll upload them later. Uh, it's a really good article by Steve that I highly recommend reading. It's all about the purpose of documentation. And the article goes through this whole story about parents teaching their kids how to drive a car. It compares like all the bad practices and the bad things you could do to, to, to teach your kids how to drive a car and compares it to bad you know, mistakes made in documentation. Like for example, in order to teach their son how to learn how to drive the car, they give him a wrench and tell him to take the whole car apart. It's really good. Okay, so now that we know why we're creating documentation, let's look into what makes good documentation. I've basically broken it down into four key components. They are the pitch, the example, the guides, and the reference. And that's actually the order of engagement as well. The pitch. So this is the first component and arguably the most important. The, the pitch is the first interaction that someone has with your documentation or even maybe your project in general. So you need to make a good first impression. And a good way to start with that is with an elevator speech. Uh, I strongly recommend having one of these. It's elevator speech being something that you can tell someone basically in the course of time. In this building, that would be quite a bit of time, but in some buildings, it would be less time. I say, you know, aim for something around 400 characters. In plain, simple words, the thing that... But what it does and why it matters. 
So your pitch should get to the heart of why someone should actually care about it. This can be sometimes hard for us because we, like, we care a lot about our own projects, and we know the benefits, and it's very obvious to us, but it's not necessarily that way for somebody else. Project. you got to kind of like imagine yourself in their shoes. Think about why it might matter to them. Will it save them time? Will it maybe make more time, but it'll like make it more stable or something else? Will it uh, offer some special features that they don't have now? Or you know, maybe it's just plain more fun, and that's completely valid as well. And for bonus points, you might even want to tell someone why they may not want to use your library the way they do. Telling someone the trade-offs involved in your project is like that's like really powerful. Um, it shows that you have a deep understanding of who your project is, and uh, shouldn't be afraid to do this. It, we should know who our project is ideal for and who it's not. Also, not acceptable. Telling someone that a package is a port of some other package in another language is not great. Uh, we get this all the time with the PHP League when people submit packages to join the league. Uh, they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is a, a Ruby package just done in PHP. It's like, that's great. I don't know what that Ruby package is, and I also don't know even what that Ruby package did, so I have no idea how that's going to be beneficial for So it's just, you know, this is, as technical people, it's easy to do this kind of thing, because, like, especially when it's, like, more popular libraries in other languages, but you got to be aware that maybe not everyone. So beyond explaining your project, you're also going to want to include some other key pieces. Um, and which ones you include will kind of differ based on your library. Um, it's good to include a license if it's a piece of, especially if it's a piece of open source. Um, a lot of people, it's easy to license. Um, it's, it's simple to include if you don't know which one to use. Get choose a license or something.com. Most PHP projects I tend to use the uh, MIT license. There's a bug tracker. Let them know where it is. GitHub issues, whatever. Author, let them know who maintains it, who they can contact. Uh, the source code, so that they can actually go and look at the source code. They can read through it. Well, it's maintained. They can see how actively it's maintained. Download it, but also give them a sense of like how like how many times has it been downloaded some statistics because again that gives people an idea of like how popular it is how trustworthy it is okay so that's uh, number one number two is the minimum viable example um have an awesome example it's so important it's this is huge you want to start with basic installation instructions and then you want to give a developer the least amount of code or whatever it is that it's going to take to get your tool or project on their system. Um, so this, this should basically let them verify in really, really short order that the code that you are offering does what you actually say it does. So I like to compare this to, uh, imagine, say, you're getting guitar lessons, right? And you go, and the, uh, the guitar instructor says to you, okay, we're going we're gonna to teach you how to learn the guitar, but we're going to start by learning 150 different chords. So I'm not a guitar player, but I understand like when you learn a guitar, there's all these different chords. So anyway, so imagine there's like 150 different ones. We're going we're gonna to teach you all the different chords, and then about six months from now, then we're going to start playing some music. You would probably say to that guitar instructor, I am out of here, because that's going to suck. What, and that doesn't happen, right? So what would happen is you would go to the guitar instructor, and they would probably teach you two or three chords of some cheesy pop song and you'll be playing it in no time and, and and that's really valuable because it gets you really excited it's like just like that you now have a sense of how this works you get you know you're getting like real feedback right away and I think that's what your simple example does as well it allows the uh, the student or the you know your user in this situation um, to get a feel for what it's going to be like and feel a quick win so that they actually believe that okay I can build on this and get this thing working um, worth noting, so this is the, the simple example on my Glide project. It's interesting, I have Google Analytics installed on that uh, site, and besides the home page, this is the second most popular page on this documentation site, and that's basically consistent across all 30 of our projects, uh, all of the documentation sites. So it's, it's definitely a popular page. 
Also, bonus points. Uh, some people prefer learning by screencast. So depending, again, on your project, this might make sense. I actually threw one together for Glide one day just out of curiosity. Um, and it basically just went through the very simple example, how to get this project up and running in the most basic form. And I was blown away by how many people actually watched it and like used that. So I, I'm not suggesting that you gotta give like your whole documentation in screencast form, but maybe for that like initial step, it's, it might be worth putting the, the, the investment and the time to do that. Again, depending on your situation. Okay, so we now have uh, our simple example in place. Now we gotta write our guides. Uh, which is the third component. Um, so they're hooked hopefully by now. You've explained to them why they should be interested. They've seen how it works. Um, so you really get into, I don't know if this is a North American phrase or not, but I call it the meat and potatoes of your actual documentation. So like every, you know, what they're really looking for. Um, and I call them guides because I think it speaks to really what you're trying to do. You're trying to guide someone through the intricacies of your library or service or project. You're trying to help them understand it. You're teaching. Have a guide for every topic that you feel needs to be covered. Um, these uh, will typically line up. Maybe if it's PHP library, it might line up roughly with your namespaces, but it doesn't have to be. Where it makes sense, feel free to deviate from that. It's not about following your namespaces, but they just might be an indication of the different areas that you should, should create. Every guide should also have its own page in the documentation. Don't be afraid to write. So I think, I think it's good to be concise, but I would err on the side of explaining too much than too little. So programmers, and I say this because I think programmers have this really good ability to when they're reading something to say, oh yeah, yeah, no, I, kn I know that, and like to skip on quickly. Um, but the reverse isn't necessarily the case. If, if you forget to like leave like a critical piece, like an important connection between two things, uh, that could leave someone like very much lost and kind of stumbling around in the woods and not knowing how to proceed. So don't worry about it being too long, basically is the concept there, because I think people can move on quickly. Like, uh, rarely do you hear someone complain, you know, with the documentation, it was pretty good, I guess, but it was like, oh man, it was so long. It's like, I don't think I've ever heard that. So, and, and having a table of contents obviously helps with this as well. And it should give, the table of contents is even helpful because it gives someone a bird's eye view of what is all contained in there. It even gives them a sense of what your library can all do. So I really like the doc, I like I really like a table of contents to even be grouped into related chunks of content. So that a lot, a lot of times how I do my documentation, like super high level concepts and then each like big concept will have all the different sections within that. So and I think that a, like the rule applies to documentation in general. Having a nice, like lots, a good, um, use of hierarchy will go a long way to helping people uh, digest your documentation. I like this one as well. Be used with your subtitles. Same sort of concept. Um, use lots of them. Um, it makes your documentation more scannable because you can look at a page and you'll be like, oh, yep, that's what I'm after, as opposed to having to like, engage with every single piece of content. It's also important to make that each title, subtitle, H2, H3, H4, make them all links like anchor links so that you can actually send someone specifically to that spot on that page in the documentation. And include lots of examples in your guides. Like you literally can't include too many, I don't think. So in the exact same way that the minimum viable example is really useful, I think just having lots of examples. I basically, for every concept that I'm trying to explain, I'll, I'll explain it and then I'll have a, a corresponding example to go along with it. All right, that brings us to the reference. So this is the fourth part of the documentation. And the, the, the main goal of the reference is basically to support those who are, have already become experts of your library. So they're the people who have traveled through your pitch. They've gone and they've done your simple example. They've become experts. They've used your library. They've used the guides. And now they're on the other side. And you're there to just support them at that point. So a lot of times, it starts with the change log. Make sure you have a change log. Um, it's a pretty simple thing to do, but it's often overlooked. Uh, a change log is really just a simple human readable version of the history of your changes um, and the ver each package release. Uh, so no show, notable, show notable changes between each release. That doesn't mean show every single commit between each release. Commit, showing commits is not helpful. You want this to be as concise as possible so people can jump in and see quickly what's happened from release to release. Uh, 
paying a special special importance to backward braking changes and uh, you can even also use this as a place to show upgrade installations and upgrade guides where needed. Uh, there is a format for this, go figure, there's a format for everything, it's called changelog. Um, I think it's at, yeah, it's at keepachangelog.com. Uh, so if you want to follow like an actual set format, do that. I'm not too concerned about that, I don't think it matters that much. Uh, this is the what I do for Glide. This is a change log. I basically just include the version number, the date it was released, and the you know, instruct you know just a list, a bullet list of all the different things that have happened in that release. And I always keep uh, I always keep uh, as many links in there as possible to things that might be useful to know, such as documentation or issues or pull requests or anything like that that might be useful to help explain somebody what happened. This is another thing I do. Like we host all the league's documentation on GitHub pages, mostly just because it's free, because we're an open source project. Um, so that works out good for us. It uses Jekyll, and there's one little handy thing that GitHub offers you if you're using GitHub pages, is they actually make the, the project information available in Jekyll. So by doing this little chunk of code here in Jekyll, I can actually automatically output the HTML for the, um, the changelog based on the actual um, release information that you set. So in GitHub for a project, for a library, for example, there's actually like a releases section where you go and actually define, you tag your new releases, and you can define them there as well. And this just automatically populates the website. So it's just a simple little step. Make sure your API docs are actually useful. So as I mentioned, like I get nervous when I think of, you know, API docs being the only thing you offer. Don't do that, obviously. But I do think they still have a value. And like you see lots of organizations, lots of services offering API docs. Um, so you can do that. Just make sure that they are well constructed. Make sure that they actually are useful. Um, put a bit of care into them, just like you would your, your actual documentation. And you also want to welcome contributions. So again, this is we're, we're speaking to the, the people who are more seasoned with your project at this point. So they're the experts really at this point because they've gone through and they've learned it all. So this puts them in a position where they can actually contribute back to the project. So that's something that you're going to want to do because it's good to invite, especially in open source projects, it's good to invite people to help out. Okay. So now we know why we write documentation, why it's important. And we know the key components that make up good documentation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of how to put it all together. So the first thing you're going to want to consider is what the ideal layout for your documentation is. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can obviously structure it. Uh, but I've noticed over the years that this is actually kind of a pattern that most people follow. And this is what it looks like. Basically, you have on the left-hand side, you have a navigation system that is essentially your table of contents ordered by higher level topics and then smaller individual topics underneath that. Uh, a lot of times you'll have some sort of navigation system to switch between versions. You have your project name and any sort of messaging at the top and a search. And then the whole right hand side will be for the actual content. So uh, I'll show you a few examples of how frequent this layout is actually used for documentation. So this is my project. From the so this is the way all the PHP League stuff is done. Laravel does this. Vagrant does this. Stripe does this. Bourbon does this. Less does this. Less JS, the CSS library. Read the docs does this. Ember does. Vue.js does, React does, Elixir does, Lattice does, Atom does. I think I've made my point. Like this is like very, very, very common layout. So don't, basically you don't need to think about this. This has been figured out. So if you follow this formula, you'll be fine. Um, and it works out well because the reason why it works out well is because a lot of times you want that, that table of contents to be your navigation system on the left-hand side. So because that can be long, having a horizontal menu really doesn't work. You want the vertical menu in that situation. So that's why I think this ends up happening a lot of times. Okay, 
so the design of your documentation matters. So it's like, okay, now we gotta like we gotta write documentation, which is hard because we're doing technical writing, which we don't want to do. And now we gotta figure out design, which is often not a skill set of ours as well. So it's like, all right, this is basically becoming impossible, but it, it's it's actually not that hard. Um, I'm gonna give you a few tips to kind of make your documentation look a little better. Um, and I think it's good to realize that just because developers, especially server side developers, um, aren't designers, it doesn't mean that they don't have an appreciation for design. Um, I think good design brings a level of credibility that anybody, you know, designer or not, can recognize. Uh, good design also shows a level of pride in your work and a level of care, and, and it shows also a level of commitment. And I think all these things are very important, and those are the type of, like, that's the type of the message that you want to deliver to people using your stuff. So here are a few simple tips to make your documentation look better. Uh, using a uh, non-standard font, such as one of these, is a great choice. I think most of these are available, or some of those are available on Google Fonts, which is free. So uh, just make sure that you stick to a sans serif font. And obviously, if you're showing code, make sure you're sticking to a monospaced font, um, because nobody wants to read code in, in one of these fonts. <coughs> but this is, you know, these are nice fonts for the actual uh, writing of your documentation. Choose a nice color scheme. It doesn't, you don't have to use the, the default bootstrap colors. Uh, and again, a little bit of effort in this area can you know, add some real personality to your project and show again that you cared. Um, obviously in situations where you have an existing brand that you're working with, you're gonna wanna maintain that. But if it's some open source project or something else, you might wanna you know, check out this site here. It's uh, Adobe Color. It's a really handy site that shows a bunch of uh, popular, uh, basically different color combinations. I use this all the time, not only for documentation, but for other stuff as well. It's a really nice site. I think it's color.adobe.com, and you can just basically go there, and it'll give you nice color combinations. Another thing to keep in mind, and this is super important, is to give your content lots of space. It's so easy to, to like not even recognize this as non-designers, but like, Having some breathing room around your content is is it goes a long way. So I would say like if you have a title or a subtitle on your page, like make sure there's like at least like 50 pixels above that title to create some white space and create some separation between content, and that also creates hierarchy, which makes it easier for people to digesting and get through your content. Use syntax highlighting. So <laughs> this always pains me. It's like I'll go to a site and it's got some documentation and for some code and I'm reading it and it doesn't have any syntax highlighting. And like I find it funny because like we go like we are pain we painstakingly choose the color color you know the color themes for our our editors and our IDEs because it matters to us. Um and and it is important because being able to have syntax highlight enabled like it makes the code like way more legible. So when it's not, when you read documentation that's just like black code on a white background, it's kind of brutal. So I, I think your documentation needs to have this enabled. It's basically an absolute must and it's really not that hard to do. So there's a couple different ways to do it and it really depends on the tool that you're using. Um, there's a PHP library that can help you with that. Um, there's also, uh, if you use GitHub pages and Jekyll, uh, that it's built in. Uh, there's, uh, I forget what it's called. I think it's called Rouge. Um, it's a Ruby syntax highlighter that's built right in, and that'll do over 60 languages, include PH including PHP. And then there's also a lightweight uh, uh, JavaScript solution called Prism.js, which uh, you basically just drop on the page, and it'll do that for you as well. And there's others. So no excuse not to. The other thing to consider adding, so that, that's it for the design stuff. I'm going to just touch on a few last things before I wrap it up here. Uh, the other thing to consider is um, search functionality. So this is always a tough one because, you know, as you know, putting together any sort of decent search tool is difficult, and for so source code, I think it's even harder. Um, or documentation is even harder, I should say. Um, so a lot of times we just don't bother do it, and we just let Google take care of that for us, and that's fine. Um, but one idea, you'll have to sort of make a, a return on investment decision here, but one tool that you might want to use is something called DocSearch. It's a tool um, put out by the folks at Algolia, I believe it is. Um, Algolia being that big, massive search-as-a-service company. Um, so 
this is great because it's completely free and you basically just sign up. They index your site and they'll give you a little chunk of JavaScript that you can then put on, the, on your site. And honestly, I got it set up and running for Glide. It took me probably 10 minutes after I got it verified because they verify everyone because Algolia actually charges a lot of money for their search services, but they offer this free for open source projects. Um, so I got it working on my site, uh, on the Glide site, and it worked really, really well in no time. Um, and I've seen it used more and more on other project, like other documentation sites. So this is a, a really good low barrier to entry uh, solution to search. Another m like really small little thing, but it makes a ton of sense. If you have documentation that's open source for an open source project, just include a link where people can send corrections because you will make mistakes in your documentation and pretty much guaranteed your users are going to find those mistakes eventually. So have a simple spot on every page that says submit a correction. And if you host your documentation on GitHub or whatever, people can uh, submit a correction right there and people can actually help you maintain your documentation. Because quite often, I think when you see a mistake in uh, uh, a piece of documentation, like you want to like report it, but it's like, oh man, that's going to be just way too much work. So if you make that easy for people, it's a nice way of basically helping improve your docs and letting other people assist you with that. I mentioned installing Google Analytics earlier. Another really simple thing you can do, I found this really helpful on our sites because I was able to look, kind of see what traffic people, what pages, well, first of all, where the people are coming from, which is always interesting, uh, but then also what pages that they're looking at. So if you see a certain number of pages um, being viewed all the time, those are pages you're going to want to look at and make sure that they're really good and they properly express the things that you need them to express. It gives you an area of focus, basically. Okay, and basically one last thought. So you'll notice I didn't talk a ton about tooling in this talk. It's more of the higher level concepts, how to put it together. It's more about the content. And I think, I think this is an easy mistake to make when you first get involved in documentation. There's a ton of documentation tools out there. And it's easy when you gotta start writing documentation to basically just go down all these different rabbit holes, of all these different tools, and, and start to figure out which one's gonna be the best and which one can automate it the most. And, and you can really sort of like use that almost as a distraction for the real tasks that you need to be doing, which is writing technical documentation. Um, so uh, when you feel the need to distract yourself, uh, don't go out and start writing a new automated documentation generator. Like that's not something you need to do. You don't need to go out and write a new documentation search engine based on Elasticsearch. It's been taken care of. Um, and, and you also don't want to give up. Um, I'd say focus on learning how to do, to write technical, do <laughs> sorry, focus on how to do technical writing. It's going to feel a bit painful at first, but as you do it, and as you see it coming together, you'll get better at it. And like I said earlier, it's not something that's just going to happen overnight. You're not going to be awesome at it the first time you do it, but like any important thing, such as testing, if you practice it, you're going to get better at it. So I leave you with this. Go forth and make awesome and Docs. Thank you. <laughs>